welcome you to the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. It's a great delight to get a chance to see you in person here at the school. This is a lecture that's part of our mini law series, a series that we started last year, was the brainchild of one of our colleagues and our communications officer, Lindsay Loomer, has been instrumental in making sure that it runs effectively. And so my sincere thanks to Lindsay as well as to Jordy, who's going to be filming uh, this evening's uh, uh, talk. Um, you are in good hands tonight with my great colleague Elaine Gibson. She is an expert in about 14 different areas, but all of them sort of meet at the nexus of tort and health law. She teaches our first year students torts and they love her dearly for it. She does a number of upper year advanced courses, including an advanced negligence course. She's regularly drawn on by governments for her expertise and she has produced over the years a myriad government reports on, on topics related to health law. She's also spent some time time uh, in her career with our clinic and so she has a sense of law and its direct human application. Uh, but more than that, I think one of the things that I like Elaine for is she's a quiet, a quiet sort of fount of wisdom here at the school and if I feel like I need someone to just step back and think something through with me, Elaine is always the right person for that exercise and so I'm deeply grateful for her uh, wisdom and her ability to kind of bring that to the table uh, in any moment when she's been asked to do so. So um, without more, I'm sure that you'll enjoy her this evening. Thank you for coming. If you find yourself in dire need of something just to perk you up, I'm sure the talk will do it. But if not the talk, there's also uh, coffee. Please feel free to go ahead and help yourself to a cup. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for the overly kind uh, introduction. The, the theme of my talk tonight, as you know, is who the heck owns my health information? And uh, I hope that the question posed uh, will uh, be made clear to the extent that it can be made clear in law um, as the talk unfolds. I thought I would start with a few kind of attention grabbers for you. And you may not have thought about all of the dimensions of this topic. So I have picked out a few of them from recent press. First, Lawsuit seeking information on sperm donor begins in BC. So this was a case that went before the courts in the last year. It was a woman who uh, was now an adult, but when she, uh, well, before she was conceived, her mother had used uh, an anonymous sperm donation through a sperm bank um, to bear her child. This woman is now an adult and a journalist and decided that she would bring a lawsuit uh, claiming an entitlement to the information about her father. Uh, she argued a right to know her genetic heritage, including the health information, and she was successful in winning her case. Next headline, tuberculosis man, sorry over plane trips. Some of you may recall this one from the media. This was uh, an American who took a plane from Atlanta, Georgia to Paris in order to get married and have his honeymoon. He happened to be a lawyer and he happened to have tuberculosis, a virulent form of tuberculosis. Uh, from Paris, he went on to Prague and then to Montreal before returning by car to the US. Uh, so, because it's tuberculosis, it's a communicable disease. This means it's a reportable disease for the public health system and the information must be shared. Uh, th this incident led to a worldwide search for people who may have sat by him or come into contact with him for other reasons on either of the transatlantic flights that he took. This is a quote from the Ottawa Citizen. Uh, by a woman whose sister was killed by a man uh, and she was arguing that a DNA data bank then um, before the federal uh, parliament should include provisions that would cover this man. We now have a DNA data bank. Uh, it falls under the criminal code. It contains the DNA of those convicted of certain kinds of heinous crimes. Uh, DNA you may realize is essentially health information at its heart. So it's not the physical piece of information, but uh, sorry, the physical 
piece of tissue, uh, but the information contained within it is the value of the information. Next, storing British Columbia babies' blood violates privacy, a group is claiming. Uh, so this has to do with um, something called blood spots. These are, this is from blood samples routinely taken in Canada from newborn babies across Canada without consent or knowledge of the uh, mother or father. Uh, and tests are done for genetic disorders. And uh, in British Columbia, the practice differs across Canada, but in British Columbia, these uh, blood spot cards were being kept indefinitely. Uh, and the claim, as you can see, is that these, well, in fact, the article reads quite inflammatorily. The BC Civil Liberties Association says as many as 800,000 babies in the province have been the victims of privacy violations that began the day they were born. A functional DNA database has been created of all the infants born, someone is quoted as saying. Next, you may have followed this in the news just in the last couple of days. It's a girl could be a death sentence. A physician published an article two days ago, I think it was, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, uh, claiming that there is common feticide happening in Canada. Uh, this is um, where women are being tested. In particular, women from particular immigrant communities are being tested for um, the sex of, the, sorry, they're, they're undergoing ultrasound and finding out the sex of the baby, uh, of the fetus, and then ch having selective abortion as a result. Um, the physician in this article argues that women should not be entitled, women and I suppose the fathers as well, not entitled to know the sex of the fetus until she is 30 weeks pregnant. The Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada has responded that this is fundamentally the woman's personal health information and she has a right to that information. Uh, in other words, it is, the, it is the woman's personal health information. So that's a smattering of recent articles that show a variety of issues, kind of a broad reaching range, I think, involving personal health information. Uh, you may not think of them necessarily as being fundamentally about health information, but there you go, I've put maybe a little bit of a different lens on it. So turning to personal health information uh, more directly then, uh, this information is seen to be worthy of the highest protection. Now, by the way, in one poll of Canadians, do you know which kind of information we were um, identified as valuing most highly? Anyone? Financial. <laughs> Financial, that's it, yeah. Um, I would have thought in the first instance that it was health information, but at least one study shows it's financial. But health comes right, um, very, right up very close to financial information. There are varying degrees of sensitivity. So um, something like one's ingrown toenail may not rank um, on the scale of anything in terms of a, an individual's uh, feeling that that information is needed to be protected. On the other hand, something like one's HIV status or um, a, the fact that someone has a psychiatric disorder, these uh, carry very high sensitivity uh, in most ways. Now, the sensitivity is context specific. So for some people, um, something like a piece of health information like a visual impairment um, would not be sensitive, but for some people, their jobs could depend on it. There are a number of values and tensions that um, I can identify. You may want to add to this list as well. Um, when I thought about what came up through the um, little news articles that I talked about already and conceptions of information. Um, and one is an intuitive sense of privacy. 
So I think we all have some sense of what privacy means, and I think that if I polled you about your response to each of the news items I've just taken you through, I think I would get differing answers, at least when I have taught privacy law. I know that those students have um, a, a wide range of responses in terms of whether um, they feel like they have nothing to hide and everything should be open for everybody, right through to um, a very strong sense of need for protection of information, a sense that um, our society is out of control right now in terms of um, releases of information and how much um, information is out there about ourselves and how and what to do to protect it. Um, next, the possibility of discrimination. So um, this uh, varies depending on the sensitivity of the information. Certainly there was a, um, a famous case about a teacher in Nova Scotia in the early days of HIV who lost his job as a result of uh, his um, colleagues finding out that he was HIV positive. Uh, there are lots of issues of autonomy and or liberty at stake. Um, for example, the man who uh, got on the plane and flew knowing that he had tuberculosis um, probably had a sense of entitlement to do that. Uh, on the other hand, there's the concept of the right to know. Not only right to know about our own health information, but perhaps the right to know information about genetics. So for instance, the BC case that I told you about, about this woman who had a very strong um, drive to know her genetic background. Uh, security, um, there's um, of course the concept of the guarding of information and who keeps it safe, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, protection of the public. So this is, of course, in part also the man who got on the plane. Um, the whole concept of public health and sharing of information about communicable disease, when society decides to step in, when government decides to step in and make laws, and we'll cover several of them, that um, not only um, uh, allow, facilitate the sharing of information that otherwise might be thought of as confidential, but at times uh, insist on that sharing of information. And then there are equality issues uh, throughout the area. So um, in the case, uh, the, the case from a couple of days ago, the, the news item about um, the um, uh, the, just a second, about the it's a girl could be a death sentence, the, the um, a selective abortion of female fetuses. Um, so there's a woman's right to know the information if the health system has access to that information. Um, on the other, and so that engages equality rights, but on the other hand, it's only the girl fetuses that are being aborted for this reason so far as we know. And so there are serious equality issues there. I'm going to speak for a moment about information privacy and confidentiality. Privacy is, I think, the more difficult of the two. The two terms are very often lumped together. People just speak of privacy and confidentiality in one breath. But there is a difference. Um, the concept of privacy, I already talked about one's intuitive sense of privacy. Uh, it's, there are many different sorts of definitions. It's a rather elusive concept. On the other hand, we know that it's focused on the individual or the group that we're talking about. Whereas on the other hand, when we're talking about confidentiality, uh, I've defined it here as a duty owed by the holder of another's information to safeguard against unauthorized disclosure. So in other words, it's always talking about a duty owed by one person to another or a person or group or organization to another. Uh, so it's other regarding as opposed to self-regarding. The duty of confidentiality in ethics comes through the Hippocratic Oath uh, in ancient history. 
that whatsoever I shall see or hear in the course of my profession, if it be what should not be published abroad, I will never divulge. And that's um, a clear, relatively clear, I think, statement. Now, when it comes to health care providers, there's an interesting little bit of reversal about confidentiality. So in your day-to-day -day functioning, if someone tells you something in most contexts, you would assume that you could in turn pass on that information to somebody else. That's how we function generally. It tends to be only if they say, oh, and please don't tell anyone, or you know this is confidential, or some kind of qualifier like that, that it would be considered to be confidential. On the other hand, throughout the world of healthcare providers, there's a presumption when someone is seeking professional services from that person, it, it's a reversal. There's a presumption of confidentiality. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the various exceptions to confidentiality, that you start with the cloak of confidentiality uh, and then look to whether um, the, the circumstance fits within one of the exceptions. The duty of confidentiality from the Hippocratic Oath that I just outlined in ethics comes through in law as well. Um, Supreme Court of Canada in 1928 picked up on this and said, uh, nobody would dispute that a secret is the secret of the patient. And normally is under his control and not that of the doctor. The patient has the right to require that the secret should not be divulged and that right is absolute unless there is some paramount reason which overrides it. Now we spend a lot of time on those paramount reasons and a little bit on confidentiality and in fact in the case where Supreme Court of Canada said this they went on to say that confidentiality did not apply. Nevertheless it is the premise that we start with. Now going to um, what happens when things go wrong. So I'm, I've I identified a few news items from recently that I thought you might be interested in. So um, one is thousands of lost Durham health records spark probes. So this was a case that had to do with uh, some flu vaccination clinics in Ontario. It concerned the records of 83,000 patients that were contained on one memory stick or USB key. Next, CBC News, November 2011, lost and dumped medical records spark privacy investigation. This was in BC. There was one unencrypted laptop that contained the information of 450 patients. The um, physician, actually, it was a researcher who lost it at the Toronto airport. Actually, yeah, a physician researcher left it at Toronto airport, lost it and reported it 10 days later. Um, also in this same news article, the records of the BC Ministry of Children and Family Development were found, a bunch of records, were found at hard copy records, were found in a dumpster behind an apartment building. And getting close to home, this article from Cape Breton, Health Authority Admits to Privacy Breach, um, so this had to do with the unauthorized release of the medical records of 277 patients to a pharmaceutical company for a research study without the proper authorization and approval. So what happens in law? How does law respond when these breaches occur? We've got a number of um, different routes within law. One is professional discipline. So one can launch a complaint with the College of Physicians and Surgeons or with the College of Nurses, et cetera, um, the self-disciplining bodies, and have it go through um, a procedure that is one of discipline of the individual. Um, another route is breach of fiduciary obligation. So in certain circumstances, physicians and other health care providers may be found to owe a professional responsibility to their patients not to release health information and it's a separate legal action that one can bring. 
At common law, there are a number of different routes. Um, negligence uh, is one. There's um, a, a, an area called intrusion upon seclusion, which has been questionable, but I just um, received notice today that the Ontario Court of Appeal has acknowledged that there is a tort of intrusion upon seclusion. Uh, so it's a fast-breaking world in a way when it comes to privacy. Um, there's also a lawsuit for contractual breach if there is a contract that can be presumed um, and that is breached. And finally, uh, in terms of the major recourses, is the breach of a statutory provision. And this is actually um, where most of privacy law is based, is on statutes. In other words, uh, governments have enacted a number of areas for protection of information generally. The first area, by the way, was um, for protection of information that governments themselves hold. Uh, and then it went on to um, more generally the private sector. So I've listed a range of statutes that are directly applicable. There are probably about 50 statutes in Nova Scotia that have provisions about confidentiality, but the main one until recently has been the Hospitals Act, and I should say until recently and including at present, but we're about to have a Personal Health Information Act that will come into effect later this year. Uh, there's a federal uh, piece of legislation called the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. There is an act that provides um, provisions that protect international disclosure of our personal information in Nova Scotia. There's the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy <coughs> Act for Nova Scotia, and there are separate federal pieces of legislation. This is information held by public bodies that has to do with. And then there's the Health Protection Act of Nova Scotia, which is the one about public health, communicable disease, and all that. I'm not going to um, go into these in detail, thank heavens, but I am going to take you to some extent through the Personal Health Information Act of Nova Scotia, the new one. Um, before we get to that, I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but you probably can, um, most of you, make out the map of Canada. <laughs> And this is to show the development of legislation protecting personal health information in the various provinces. Nova, and the dates, um, most of them I think you can see, but some of them are in white, unfortunately. Um, so Nova Scotia is by no means one of the first to bring in such legislation. In fact, the only places now that don't have coverage are Little Prince Edward Island and the territories. So, turning to Personal Health Information Act, it was passed by the legislature in December 2010 after a number of attempts. Uh, the regulations are being drafted right now and it's anticipated that it'll be in force later this year. It's going to repeal the Hospitals Act Section 71. Excuse me, so that piece of prominence right now is going to fade away uh, and be repealed. Now who is covered by the legislation? Well the Department of Health and Wellness itself is covered as well as the District Health Authorities and IWK, regulated health professionals and others by regulation. So not everyone who is holding health information falls under the statute. It's only those who can are within the definition of regulated health professionals and those the government has um, chosen to regulate. The body or person must have custody or control of the record or information, and it includes the agents of custodians, such as Medivy Blue Cross. <clears throat> what kind of information is covered? Well, personal, it, it's only about personal health information. Uh, and this is defined as identifying in information about an individual, note, whether living or deceased. Um, what is identifying information? Well, we have a definition of that as well. 
It's information that identifies an individual or where reasonably foreseeable in the circumstances could be utilized either alone or with other information to identify an individual. Uh, so either alone or with other information. So envisaged there in part is uh, the merging of databases, for instance. So very much of your information is contained in electronic databases and when Combined with other databases, it's a powerful tool for a number of purposes, including health system administration, including research, those sorts of things. And it's known that if you combine non-directly identifying information, a few pieces of that information, then it can become identifiable. Uh, so the, the statute recognizes that. Now, implicitly, but uh, worthy of note, I'm talking about what kind of information is covered. That means the, there is a whole body of information which is non-personal health information which is not covered. I'm going to touch on some significant aspects of the statute itself just so that you have some grounding in it and then I'll talk in more general terms, not about this statute, but in generally about the protections in law and the circumstances for disclosure of information and touching on ownership. Um, so the Personal Health Information Act contains rules for the collection, use, and disclosure of information, um, but also its retention, its disposal, and its destruction. For the collection, use, or disclosure of information, um, it's necessary to identify the purpose uh, and one is confined to that purpose and one is only entitled to collect information that is legitimately required for the stated purpose. Consent is needed for the collection, use, and disclosure of information, but it's subject to a range of exceptions. Some significant exceptions are within the circle of care, and this is a concept that has developed, uh, not it's not directly named in statute, but the concept of circle of care is um, to um, encapsulate the sharing of information for re the receipt of health services. Um, and so that's thought of as the circle of care, those who need the information in order to provide care to an individual. The concept of knowledgeable implied consent, uh, it's further defined, and we can talk about that in discussion if you would like to, but um, the idea is that it's not necessary within the circle of care to get a patient's consent at every instance when, um, for instance, um, a bill is being submitted um, uh, to Blue Cross or something. Uh, as long as you can assume that the patient is consenting in that circumstance and as long as it's um, for the uh, circle of care or provision of care or submission of bills um, for that purpose, then um, knowledgeable implied consent suffices. Um, each each custodian must provide proper security for the information uh, and an overseer is required. In other words, someone who is responsible for privacy within the organization. An individual is entitled to know what information is being held by the custodian and also to request its correction. And a complaint about a breach of the Personal Health Information Act is to the privacy review officer. Now I'm going to talk more generally about consensual releases in law, followed by the non-consensual circumstances for release. Uh, these are the topics I'll be covering, the patient right of access, other healthcare providers, surrogate decision maker, and other third parties. So when it comes to the patient right of access, this is kind of the core of the question that I worked into the title of my talk. Uh, I was kind of playing on words about a little bit in saying who owns my health information. Implicit in the my is that we think that it's our information, um, but there are 
questions about who actually could claim to own the information. Uh, there was a case that went before Supreme Court of Canada in 1992. It's called McInerney and McDonald. And this uh, case came out of New Brunswick. A woman was seeing a new physician and she, the physician changed um, her prescription. She suggested she go off thyroid medication. And the woman was interested then, uh, Mrs. McDonald was interested in seeing the rest of her personal health information because she was wondering why a previous physician had put her on this medication. Uh, and so Dr. McInerney said, well, I will give you access to the health records that I have produced and the tests that I have ordered on your behalf, but I can't give you the information from previous health care providers. You'll have to go to each of them and um, seek the information from them. Case went to Supreme Court of Canada, and Supreme Court of Canada said, fundamentally, this is Mrs. McDonald's own information. So there's a confirmation in there um, that fundamentally it is our own information. On the other hand, they use vague terms in saying they won't reify it to a property interest. Um, so the ownership is left a little bit questionable. They also indicated that the institution or physician owns the physical health records. Uh, and there's some sense to that because there's an obligation on healthcare providers to keep records. It's not like they could just hand them right back over to a patient if a patient wanted. Um, but therefore, the court found a patient is entitled to access to their information. There's one exception laid out in the judgment, and that is where there's a significant risk of harm to the health of the patient or of a third party. So the question posed in the title to my talk is left a little bit unclear, um, but with hopefully a little bit more clarity than we started out with. Consensual release to other health care providers. It's based again on the concept of knowledgeable implied consent for therapeutic purposes within the circle of care. If there's any ambiguity or doubt, then um, it would be appropriate for a health care provider to get actual consent. And in certain circumstances, actual consent is the best practice anyway, even if the law doesn't set that as the standard. Now, where there is a person who is incapacitated, the surrogate decision maker, and there's a ranking laid out in terms of who becomes the surrogate decision maker, who has the entitlement, they step into the shoes of the patient for all purposes that we're talking about here in terms of their ability to make decisions about release of information. Uh, there is um, consensual release is permitted to other third parties. This is with the consent of the patient or of their surrogate and preferably it is obtained in writing. Now we're getting to the tougher area really, I think, and that is um, we've covered the consensual release circumstances, um, but there are various provisions um, either permitted or um, uh, insisted upon in law for the non-consensual release where the patient is refusing um, and I'm going to talk first about the provisions that provide for non-consensual release for the sake of the patient, him or herself, uh, and then talk about where it's for the sake of others that information is to be released. Emergency circumstances. So this would apply where a patient is unable due to infirmity to decide uh, whether the information can and should be released. And there's a danger to their health or safety if the information flow is delayed in the circumstances. It's only permitted, however, if there is no advanced directive refusing the information flow 
and where there's no substitute decision maker refusing the information flow. Um, and this principle comes out of a case out of Ontario called Mallet versus Shulman. It was in a different context. It was not to do with release of information per se, but to do with, um, a, it was a woman who went into hospital unconscious. She was brought by ambulance following a serious car accident. And she had a card in her wallet saying, Jehovah's Witness, I refuse blood transfusion under all circumstances for religious reasons, and it went on to say that she understood the implications, et cetera. Um, the physician provided blood transfusions regardless because he felt that her, um, that, uh, that she would die if she didn't have the transfusions, and he had other justifications as well about not knowing whether she might have changed her mind if she had known. The Ontario Court of Appeal made a very strong statement of right of the individual to make decisions about their own health care um, and that even if their um, life or health is at stake, we fundamentally have the autonomy to make those decisions. And so um, the same principles apply to the release of information. If there's an advanced directive um, that refuses the sharing of information, then it must be respected. Now, there is an, an Adult Protection Act. There are different Adult Protection Acts in every jurisdiction in Canada. Uh, ours um, says that the act is to uh, provide a means whereby adults who lack the ability to care and fend adequately for themselves can be protected from abuse and neglect. Um, and so it goes on to say that every person who has information, whether or not it is confidential or privileged, uh, and privilege is something we haven't talked about yet, um, but this um, is in particular reference to lawyer um, client privilege and the um, usual sacrosanctness, um, the usual absolute privacy that pertains to that information that is shared between a client and a lawyer. But here's a provision that says we're setting aside privilege in this circumstance if someone has information that an adult is in need of protection. Uh, and then it um, speaks in mandatory terms. It says, shall report that information to the minister. So it's an obligation on every person to report. Uh, it defines adult as a person who is or is apparently 16 years of age or older. And then there's a, a quite involved definition of who constitutes an adult in need of protection. Now, what about if the disclosure of information is in the best interest of the patient or individual? The answer is no. So um, this applies even if harm or death will result. Um, it's not appropriate for a healthcare provider to um, report to others, for instance, that a person is apparently suicidal. Um, there is an exception to that, and that is the pro if the person falls within or appears to fall within the provisions of the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act. Uh, in order to fall within those provisions, one must be um, um, suffering from a mental disorder and threatening or attempting to cause serious harm to self or others or likely to suffer serious physical impairment or serious mental deterioration uh, if left unattended. Un, uh, uh, likewise, the, and furthermore, the person has to lack the capacity to make admission and treatment decisions. So those were the areas for non-consensual release believed to be in the best interests of the patient. Uh, now we're going on to non-consensual release that is in others' interest. In other words, one can assume primarily against the interest of the individual. 
And the first is child abuse. So our society has made a major exception to the general rule of confidentiality of personal health information when, um, in order to facilitate the protection of children. And this first provision says that every person who has information, again, it's um, um, setting aside confidentiality and or privilege, uh, indicating that a child is in need of protective services, shall forthwith report that information to the agency. So um, we see some mandatory language in there. Now, what is it to be in need of protective services? Well, there's a, um, a list uh, about the person either suffering or being at risk of suffering from abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, failure to provide needed medical services. So this is where the provisions kick in actually to do with um, parents who are uh, refusing medical services for their children. Uh, emotional harm or engaged in criminal activities. Now the standard is higher for professionals. So every person who performs professional or official duties with respect to a child, and it goes on to include healthcare professionals, um, if they come across information in the course of their professional duty, if they have reasonable grounds to suspect, so I'm gonna if I can take you back um, two slides. The, this one said every person who has information indicating that a child is in need of protective services shall report. In this case, it's on the basis of reasonable grounds to suspect. So it's a lower standard. In other words, a lesser amount of information uh, on the part of a professional gives rise to a duty to forthwith report the suspicion and the information upon which it is based to the agency. So big exception for child protection. Prevention of harm to others. So there's an obligation developing in law and ethics and you'll find um, similar language within the new Personal Health Information Act on this. Um, so far, the courts have said may, so they're not using the mandatory language of shall that you saw in the legislation we looked at just now, um, but that a, an individual may disclose information that is otherwise confidential and or privileged because in the main Canadian case this came out of, it was actually um, solicitor-client privilege context. Um, the information may be disclosed without consent if you have all of these elements present. The threat of serious bodily harm or death, and it has to be to a third party or a defined group, so it's not to oneself. Um, the threat must be imminent, um, and the person must have a reasonable belief that that threat will materialize into harm. Uh, the circumstance where it um, came in the Canadian, in, well, in the American context, um, the case of Tarasov was of a man who reported to his psychologist that he had a detailed plan to kill his former girlfriend. He was um, upset with her for having uh, left him, and he outlined a detailed plan, and it f was found to give rise to, in that case, a reporting obligation. The Canadian case involved a person who had, had been convicted of a crime and a psychologist was examining him for purposes of um, assessing, I believe it was a probation report at the time. And uh, during the co course of their discussion, the person, report, the um, prisoner reported a detailed plan uh, to kill a number of prostitutes in the Vancouver area. And he outlines um, in, as I say, quite some detail with specifics how he was going to do it. And um, so this judgment came out of that case. Uh, and it's developing in law and ethics because we're not, it, in a way it's not as helpful perhaps to healthcare professionals to say you may disclose this information because it puts the onus back onto the health professional to decide whether the circumstances are right for reporting. Um, now there's release for legal proceedings and 
Um, the, the, so if a subpoena is issued for the release of information in a circumstance where um, confidentiality applies, then the appropriate route is for the person to actually attend at the hearing but not release the information, attend at the hearing and argue the confidentiality of the information and let the um, ju judicial or quasi-judicial officer make a decision. However, if it's a warrant, it's already been issued by the court and the healthcare provider must release that information if there's a warrant. So the obligation then is to ensure that one keeps within the um, terms of the warrant itself and doesn't release any more information than necessary. Um, and then there are lots of provisions for, for, for instance, release of information for purposes of discipline of a healthcare provider. Um, and or um, the healthcare system um, for ensuring that billings have been appropriate, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so public health is the last area that I'm going to mention and then um, I'll open it up for discussion. Um, so in the public health legislation, um, there's a list of communicable or reportable diseases um, and it is mandatory for a physician and sometimes others to report to the public health officer if they have information that someone is, uh, that has contracted uh, one of these communicable diseases. And then there's a set of corresponding obligations. And so there may be an obligation to notify the contacts of that person. That um, obligation may rest on the individual or it may rest on the um, public health officer and um, there uh, are other provisions in there for uh, release of personal information. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, my question just relates to the conversion that's uh, oncoming to electronic health records and uh, whether or not that information is accessible now to people in general if you want to start to try to find your own health portfolio or health record. Oh, the latter part I'm not so familiar with. I know there have been a couple of um, software companies that have um, offered for purchase um, the kind of record that is meant to eventually be one that you could compile all your personal health information into. Um, you know that there was a move to um, developing such a record in Ontario, the eHealth Ontario um, situation kind of went down in flames with both with complexity and with um, other serious problems with its um, uh, running, its operation. But uh, I, to my knowledge, we're not in a place now where we can have our little card and go to our doctor and go to the hospital. Well, for sure not in Nova Scotia. Um, and it's, various provinces have developed different sorts of electronic record systems. Um, BC and Alberta being the most advanced in that regard. Um, but usually the, the state of the art is for the information to be um, shareable, ideally, between physician and hospital, uh, and possibly um, with the pharmacies. And Premiers into this latest meeting that they're having now are talking about reinvigorating the, the conversion to electronic records. And I guess my question is very simply, if I want my information, can I get Oh, can you get your information? Yes, in Nova Scotia. So once the Personal Health Information Act comes into place, um, certainly you'll have a, 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 I should say, I'm just wondering if this is exaggerating, but basically a crystal clear um, right to know the information that is being held. Uh, in Nova Scotia right now, the information provisions are are more generally under the case of McInerney and McDonald that I referred to. 
So you certainly have an entitlement to request access to the information. You have an entitlement to that information assuming that it doesn't fall within the significant risk of harm to yourself or others for that information to be revealed to you. Um, but the healthcare provider or institution is entitled to place a reasonable charge on your access to that information. So that's the basic answer. And when it is electronic, um, it should, in theory, be even easier to gain access to that information at lower cost. But um, we're only in the process of developing a hospital-based electronic health record system in Nova Scotia, and it is not far along in my understanding. Now, individual physicians have some information on electronic health records. Yes? There's been a, a trend, perhaps in the last couple of years, on, on internet uh, privacy problems with some of the major service providers that have resulted in class actions that have really resulted in very large settlements, which I'm not quite sure what the consumer gets out of it. Do you see any evidence of, of uh, you mentioned it in part when you talked about privacy or health privacy, privacy in general, emerging as a tort thing. Do you see any evidence of the class action rug on some of these major breaches that occurred across the country in various jurisdictions, in various hospital records, for example, or personal health records? So, so you're thinking, for instance, in the one that I said, 83,000 patients in, or yeah, clients in, um, in Ontario. So could they bring a class action um, suing the district health authority uh, f for violation of one of the various rights that I went through? You know, in theory, it's there. But boy, it's a slow-moving kind of area, don't you think? I know you have a lot of experience with this. And well, just, just what I've read in the last 12 months, it appears that I would have thought the internet would have been a major problem because it damages is always the problem in terms of proving it. Well, yeah. And some of the cases, like one in Saskatchewan, where someone's uh, uh, hepatitis record was appeared in the remand center, that makes one yeah. of the classic cases. But that's yeah. probably the only one that you can really major health case that you can really, really find across the country. I'm just, I That's wouldn't right. have thought internet uh, class actions would have, would have resulted in the settlements. Like, I think, I'm not sure it was Sony or a couple of the others. There's an outfit in Ontario, a law firm in Ontario, that's specializing in this and even going after other jurisdictions with mixed, mixed success other than the locale of, of the group. I'm just wondering if that's, I don't know if there's any evidence of that in the United States that would have been yeah, I, I, I think that um, for the law to be used practically in this area, the root is more statute-based than it is at common law. I think that people just have less motivation, actually, to bring this kind of lawsuit. Usually if someone is dealing with a, a well, for one thing, a lot of breaches of health information are not known at present, quite likely, of personal health information. But secondly, if they're known, it's very often someone who is in a circumstance where um, um, a breach of confidentiality is the least of their problems if they're dealing with serious health issues. And uh, so I think that um, it's just not caught on readily. And so at least the provinces are developing these alternative routes, which are usually more uh, uh, kind of user-friendly and less costly. They have disadvantages compared to an actual um, lawsuit through the um, system of tort or contract or um, fiduciary duty, but uh, they at least provide a more ready route. Now, in this province, as in others, the price of access to that system is something that is vulnerable to going up. Um, when a government needs to uh, collect more money. So that's a, another problem. Nevertheless, launching a legal action is more costly. And for a class action, you have to have a lawyer who is um, initiating and encouraging, and you have to have people who are motivated enough. And, yeah, we really don't seem to have that right now. 
Another question? Yes? The uh, practical side of accessing the information, are these new acts that, you, that are just an act typical of the Federal Privacy Act, like say, you, there's a form, you fill it out, you send it in, you make a request, uh, your request lapses if, in a year, if nothing happens, you have to keep requesting, there's a right of correction. Um, how, does it operate like that? Who do you complain to if you make a request for your information and nothing happens? Right. So um, the the request for information, I'm hoping, will <laughs> will function smoothly. Um, a, requ a a a complaint when it comes to a breach. Um, there are provisions in the statute. There are um, lengths of time laid out. I believe right in the statute. If not, then it'll definitely be in the regulations in terms of how quickly a response is required. Um, there, I, I, I'm not sure that there can be a fee for a complaint under the Act, um, but that's going to be, so. yeah, I'll get to that in a second. So that's going to be in the regulations. But um, basically, the complaint is to someone called the Privacy Review Officer. Um, and so, this is um, the, so we have had the um, Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Under that, we have a review officer. Uh, it wasn't called a privacy review officer, but with recent changes, this same person will be handling both sides of it. And so they will be handling the, um, the complaints under this statute. So the complaint is to the Privacy Review Officer for Nova Scotia. And does it carry a right of correction or annotation? Which is once you get it and it's incorrect. Uh, oh, okay. So if there's, if there's, a, so if your question now is if there's an error in your record and you have an entitlement to request a correction to it, um, and the healthcare provider has to respond to that com to that um, request for correction. And they have, uh, th there's various tests laid out in the statute, but let's assume that you're right and the information in the record is wrong, then you have the entitlement to have that information corrected. And yes, the privacy review officer would ultimately hear um, a complaint from you if that information was not corrected. Okay, yes? Um, and with concern to, uh deciding how, how it's determined that somebody may be harmed by accessing their own records. How does that decision get made and what kinds of things get taken into account, uh, in particular, I guess, with psychiatric information? Right. So that's, that's the trickiest and that's, frankly, the only area that I have ever been able to think of where there could be an issue about um, um, whether someone could, whether Gaining that information stands a risk of serious harm to oneself, uh, is the area of psychiatric. And um, the, the case law doesn't give us too, too much guidance on that. It does say that it is the obligation of the uh, physician or other healthcare provider to, to justify that grounds exist for refusal of information. In other words, the onus is not on the individual requesting the information to establish that they are entitled to it and it won't be harmful to themselves. The obligation is on the healthcare provider who um, is inclined to decline um, the uh, access to such information. And um, I see Donna Franey, director of our um, Dalhousie Legal Aid Service, in in the audience here and. Donna may remember that when I was at Dow Legal Aid, uh, I had um, requested a client's medical file and the doctor wrote back and refused and said no. And I wrote back and said, McInerney and McDonald, clear right of the client to this information. And the doctor then did provide the information but said that he was totally opposed. This is so offensive and patients will have wrong information in their hands and um, uh, they won't know how to interpret it and it'll be dangerous. So, but we did get the information, but it was, uh, and you probably still have circumstances where they're refusing, right? 
Pardon me? We do all the time. You do all the time, yeah. So, um, but the, the, but the basic test is, as I had said, um, in the statute, oh, I don't know if I can see the wording immediately about um, release, but I can find it for you after what's going to be in the Personal Health Information Act. Um, but it's very similar to the wording just as I put it up on the screen. So beyond that, it's to the physician to justify how they fit within the wording of that. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Um, you talked about varying sensitivities about health information. Uh, did you find that there was a correlation with stigma and sensitivity of how people felt about their health information? The stigma of various illnesses, uh, like mental illness or an HIV diagnosis. Oh, yeah. How, how that sensitivity of uh, things that might be changed by perception by society. Yeah, what an interesting question because um, it, it, you would think that it would correlate strongly with um, stigma, that that is maybe a major, if not the motivating factor for people to be sensitive about their personal health information. Um, I do recall in one study I was involved in, I think it was, uh, there, there was some surprising results, like I think that, um, well, surprising to me at least and the other researchers at the time, I think it was diabetes that was ranked quite highly that people did not want that information and intuitively that would not have been as high as some sorts of psychiatric disorder, but it was up there um, in the one. Uh, and, you know, we hadn't asked the question, oh, and why would that be? So I can't actually explain why that is, but I think you get, you get probably a fairly strong correlation, but then there are some surprising results as well, perhaps. Yes? Joe? Uh, just a bit of context. <coughs> it seems sometimes when we talk about the information access, uh, we don't differentiate between information and knowledge. And this, I think, has to be a uh, in the front comment about uh, possible implied harm if somebody has access to information they can't actually interpret. Um, uh, I think, for me, information is not knowledge, and so uh, the issue is that <coughs> whether or not you hand over information. Historically, my issue has been I'll hand over to someone actually if you identify a qualified professional, I'll hand it over all the information. But to hand over explicitly a full file with somebody who has no formal training to pick things up is a bit of a concern. Um, I mean, when you look at uh, health information, it's not one or two data points. The uh, convergence and pattern system is actually, in, you know, the, the convergence is the uh, essence of diagnosis and, and treatment determination. So, Isolated bits of information is a big concern. I'm not referring to your general cases here, but you know, this freedom to access to all kinds of information going back and forth. Um, so I, I think that's a, an issue that needs to be addressed. And, and the second point is, I do have concerns, um, you know, we need to study it carefully, but what you may find over a period of time is that there needs to be careful monitoring of whether or not people actually modify eventually what information they put down. So, you have a practitioner who's out there and is concerned about how much information is going out and where it may go out. You might find over a period of time that how the information is recorded and less recorded uh, may start to change over a period of time. And that's, uh, uh, you know, partly a defensive alert. Uh, but on the flip side, we need to be alert to that because it could greatly affect the clarity of the information recorded and therefore trans, uh, transfer to another practitioner who's consulting with patient. So these are things we need to keep a, a, well, that was one of the arguments in McInerney and McDonald, the Supreme Court of Canada 1992 judgment. Uh, well, not everything you said, but one of the arguments was, um, well, one was patients wouldn't know how to interpret it properly, but another was um, physicians would not record information in the same way as in the past and that they would be limited in what they could record. And the court um, re refused to accept that argument and said that um, if, if a healthcare provider would write one way to themselves and their community and a different way, thinking that the patient might have access to it um, and not like what they read in it or something, they just found that to be um, spurious, um, to be uh, an argument that 
was not convincing. Um, I, it's an argument that is being made in the context of electronic health records, um, and that um, the information gets changed as a result of um, the, the way that one has to provide the information in the record and also with the um, likelihood of access by others. I, I don't know, I think that um, in terms of whether people will misinterpret the information that they receive, I, I do think that my general inclination is to think that people um, can seek resources if they need help <coughs> interpreting the information, but that um, I think it is more our information than it is the healthcare provider's information fundamentally. So that would be my thinking on it. Yes? Uh, I want to get back to your basic uh, question there. Who the heck owns my uh, health information? Yeah. The insurance companies uh, require that you take uh, uh, a test or so for life insurance, disability, or health insurance, and they pay for the test, but it goes into a data bank. And then other insurers have access to that data bank. And even your medication, they pay for them, and they send like for some other company. Your pharmacy sends in the record to them, so they have a record of all your medications and also your tests from doctors. And now, granted, you might give them consent to uh, take a particular test for that insurance, but they use it continuously and. Now with this high tech in genetics, um, your siblings, they can uh, screen out your siblings or whatever. So who, who the heck owns your information? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, the, so the circumstance where someone um, it undergoes a medical examination by a physician who is hired by an insurance company um, and or by one's employer, let's say, for those purposes, that's a very, um, uh, that's a very tricky situation and I, you would have to look very closely at that particular circumstance. My guess is that when the information, prior to the information being collected, the individual is um, asked to sign a form. And my guess is that in that form, one is agreeing to the surrender of whatever information is provided during the course of the interview. Um, and that uh, that information then is actually handed over for many purposes. Um, and it's done through consent, but it's done in a way that the patient or the individual may not um, be very aware of what they're agreeing to at the time. Uh, and then in terms of the, um, sharing of information after that. Well, that's part of um, what we're facing right now is the um, collection of information into um, databases and without necessarily the knowledge of what's going to be done with that information. And with certain non-consensual uses being made of that information, such as for research purposes. Um, does anyone have specific knowledge of the insurance context? No, okay. Um, next question over here somewhere. Yes? Um, I have a, a specific question and a health information uh, related to uh, uh, delivery of health services that may be a little outside the means you So, um, and the example is on a a first nation where they, for the most part, will have some form of a health center, which is funded through, usually funded through, or primarily funded through a federal government contribution agreement on the transfer payment, right. um, and delivered by band employed uh, health professionals at the health center, and ultimately the chief of council and band administration. Um, and the, that funding comes with, uh, you know, with the agreement for funding, which has uh, abilities of the government to, to do any kind of ministerial audit or a compliance review 
or program review of uh, a particular program that's delivering. For example, it could be like a home care program that's delivered by a health center on reserve. Uh, how would that, if, the, if there was a program review or compliance review or audit or what have you being conducted by the whatever federal department, then uh, how, what do you, what would you see sort of as the, the picture of how that would be responded to in terms of the rights of the government to ask for that and then the, the healthcare provider and the employer in that situation of the First Nation in, provi in, in providing that uh, information, which in which you would at some point get into personal health information in the robotics. In the course of the audit, yes. So um, it's it, it's a an interesting and detailed question, <laughs> and so let me pull back a little bit from it to say that in every piece of information legislation that I've seen, um, there is a provision for uh, non-consensual access to personal health information for purposes of auditing and monitoring of use of resources, those sorts of terms are used in there. So I would think that that is contained in the federal legislation, um, in, it, but I'd have to look for sure at it. But I did want to add, um, to, so, so I'm answering in a general way because you're, you, know, you would have to look in great detail. Um, but I also did want to mention um, thinking of your question, that the Aborig the National Aboriginal Health Organization, that's not the, exactly the correct title for it, but a National Aboriginal Health Organization um, is the only national body, to my knowledge, which has actually asserted ownership of health information. So it's... Um, the answer, who the heck owns my health information, the answer by um, the National Aboriginal Organization is, we own our health information, um, and no other group, as I say, has spoken quite as strongly about that. Do you know the actual title of the group? I think that's the correct title. Do you think it, it is? NAHO. The, yeah. the acronym NAHO. that's, yeah, okay. Yes? Um, I'm going to ask in the concept you talked about a circle of care, and when you're talking about exemptions, it said consent suffices within the circle of care. Yeah. And I thought you said there was a definition of what circle, does that include professional circle of care, circle of care within the same health institution, or would it be circle of care <coughs> professions outside of that? It's a term that I hear used more and more frequently to include more and more things. Right. A bit of a, I, I think the journey is slippery slope. slope, slope. Right. In the circle of care and, and how convenient it is sometimes to add to the definition of community something. Right. So the term is does not come up in the Personal Health Information Act, not directly. Um, the concept is there. The term, to my knowledge, was first used in a document issued by Industry Canada when the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act was first um, to apply to healthcare services. So I believe that was 2002. Um, and you can look it up online if you go to the Industry Canada website and then you go to Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, you'll find it there. And it's a strange place for a, um, for a discussion of healthcare services, but it's because this statute applies to commercial activity. <laughs> and that's where the, the concept, or I shouldn't say the concept, but the term circle of care, um, where to my knowledge it was first used, and you'll find a definition of it there. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Does, does copyright ever apply to either healthcare data or information? Oh, good question. Um, and um, there was a decision in Australia, 
I talked about the case of McInerney and McDonald because it's the, the most guidance we have on ownership and right to access information. There was a case in Australia um, that went to their high court uh, and McInerney and McDonald was argued to assert a patient right of access to information and the court um, was kind of sneering of the Supreme Court of Canada and said, no, patients of course do not have a right to access their information and there are problems with copyright of that information because a physician's own um, diagnosis, for instance, goes into the record and um, so there are copyright issues. I haven't seen it explored fully in law and copyright is not my particular area, but I think there are tensions there that have not been fully sorted out actually of copyright in information contained within a record. Yes, Diane? Um, well, one just brief comment on the, the auditing post. My understanding is that those sorts of audits have to be done in a way that the information is not identifiable to a particular person. Is that not? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, there may be organizations that strive to, um, you know, I was talking about best practice and then what's contained in law, but no, the provisions in the statutes that certainly um, even in the new Personal Health Information Act, it's not non-identifiable information, it is identifiable. Uh, there, may, It may be stripped away at a certain point along the way. That, that wasn't my original reason for raising my hand, which is, in spite of the framework that you're talking about, it seems to me there are some standard practices that routinely breach. For example, you know, doctor's offices, hotel, as hospital uh, waiting rooms, people's names get called out that you're the next patient. Or you go to pick up your um, medication at a pharmacy and you overhear conversations with somebody else where it's you know, their, the details of their medical situation are being discussed and often there are supposedly private cubicles to do that but they're never used from what I can see and even if they were they're not really private anyway or for example I had a few years ago you know I had cataract surgery and I don't know how common this is but the, the setup for that was that the, the pre-operative setup was an open area where there were you know, several chairs and you could hear discussions with all of the patients where you know, nurses were asking about people's medication history and whatever. And I was overhearing a conversation about, you know, antidepressant drugs that this person had been taking. I was feeling really uncomfortable overhearing this conversation. But I mean, that, it's an open area and that, there seemed to be no concern about that kind of issue. Could people hear at the back? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I just have to agree absolutely. Like. I um, did a piece for the, uh, the uh, publication on pharmacy and on seamless care, which is kind of all the sharing of information among healthcare providers and um, uh, the issues to do with that. And in particular, a lot of it being electronic issues and everything. But I ended it by saying that I actually thought for pharmacists the big, you know, the the biggest breaches that happen are right at that counter where the the um, person is interacting with the pharmacist. They have set up those booths more recently, though. Like the, those are attempts. I think I, they're they're inadequate attempts. I agree absolutely, and they. Uh, are not operating as they should, but at least I think with um, greater awareness of the importance of confidentiality that there is more turning one's mind to con the need for confidentiality. It's imperfect for sure. And, and part of your point may be that we ourselves are uh, because in the conversation you're talking about, everyone was, the, the person, the patient was readily discussing this, her or himself, is that right? Yeah, so um, I'm... But that, I mean, they really didn't have a choice of saying, well, you know, can we go somewhere else and talk about this? I mean, they, oh, they were, that, but oh, it was with the healthcare provider. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, I agree, absolutely. So, but, uh, you know, I suppose I would hope that with greater um, um, attention 
through legislation and obviously there's a fair amount of interest for this kind of turnout in this room on a Wednesday evening um, on a topic that some would consider boring, I think, <laughs> the topic of health information, shows um, an interest, right? And surely that interest combined with some protections will filter through to at least some degree of protection, but uh, as imperfect as it is, yes? Uh, given the fact that the ownership of uh, patient information and confidentiality is a hot, hot topic right now in the United States, in your opinion, what are the countries that are doing a good job of protecting that information, providing legislation that gives us protection and confidentiality and all the good things we need right now? And what are they doing right? Oh, boy. Um, so Europe has had greater protections. In fact, I spoke about the um, federal legislation, Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. That was brought about because it was forced by the European Union. The European Union said, we will discontinue the sharing of certain kinds of data with you, Canada, unless you bring in greater protections. Um, for information. Oh, was it the right thing to do? Well, um, it, it helped. Um, I, I couldn't point to a place right now that has really um, accomplished excellence in privacy and confidentiality. Um, in terms of electronic health record systems, I could point to New Zealand, which is bringing in um, a system. They are building it from the ground up, so it doesn't ha require the massive investments that have been necessary and continue to be necessary in Canada. Um, and it has done it with consultation and with um, um, full involvement of the various providers and if you call us consumers of health information. So, so the walk is there, not as yeah. necessarily um, Was and is. It's not fully constructed yet, but um, New Zealand is a small nation as well, and so it may be easier for them to go a about such a thing in a um, meaningful and consultative way, but I don't think that's a good excuse not to be trying to look to models like that in Canada. Uh, last question, okay. Not a question. You were asking if somebody has a concrete example or, or knowledge about the industry or the insurance industry. I don't have any, but a very disturbing situation happened to me. Um, a number of years ago, a colleague asked me about a professor at Dalhousie uh, who happened to be a friend of mine, how he is doing. And I didn't. Answer. I just asked, why do you ask? And it turned out that this colleague was a lawyer for the insurance company who was supposed to provide him with disability. Oh. So, so much for that. And Ooh. I see that one of the topics to be discussed is the virtuous lawyer, not that person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could. I'm so yeah. glad I asked why you asked. Oh, that's an I excellent question. Yeah, I thought and it was a common interest, but it was Okay, very good um, ending. And I am, uh, I have copies here. I'm with the Health Law Institute here at Dalhousie, <coughs> and I have copies of our seminar series, so I'm making a little plug. Come and pick up one of these posters and... If you want to be on our mailing list for it, there's a, a sign-up sheet uh, to get on the email list. Uh, so thank you all for coming.